Tom Smith Grant College Cottage Volunteer, banjo player extraordinaire, and those were, as you might have guessed, three Irish war songs. The Rising of the Moon, When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again, and The Minstrel Boy. My name's Steve Trim. I'm a Grant Cottage tour guide. I do uh, a fair number of porch chats every summer. This is the first one. Check out our website. We've got some good ones coming up. And I apologize for the weather. I thank you for uh, risking your lives in this heat. I think Ulysses S. Grant faced conditions like this at Vicksburg, probably. But he pulled through, and so will we. I want to give you uh, the inspiration for this porch chat. Last fall, I gave a talk at the Schenectady Public Library. It was relating to Grant Cottage. And the woman who had booked my appearance uh, had a, sort of a display table set up in the room where I spoke. And on the table were a sword, some old photographs from the Civil War era, and as I was to find out, a batch of letters. The sword the photograph and the letters all pertained to a member of the Fighting 69th, 
the New York 69th, one of the mainstays of the Irish Brigade. And I began thinking about the Irish and their relation to Ulysses S. Grant. Perhaps there was a story here. During the Civil War itself, Grant obviously had a lot of respect for the Irish Brigade, but he had a lot of respect for many other regiments too. There seemed nothing unique along those lines. But then I realized, as I thought about it, that many members of the 69th New York were Fenians. Now, if you don't know what the Fenians were, you're in for a really good story. The Fenians were Irish revolutionaries who, after the Civil War, in an effort to free Ireland from England, decided that they would invade Canada, seize territory, and hold it in exchange for Ireland's freedom. The Fenians at this point were veterans of the Union Army, and Ulysses S. Grant was still in command of the American armies. So in 1865, Grant is embracing the Irish soldiers as his brothers in arms, and in 1866, they are creating an international incident, and he has to deal with them. <laughs> I thought maybe here is a story. So that was the inspiration. I'll tell you a little more as we go along. The person who showed me the sword and the photos and the letters is right here. Stand up. <laughs> Joya Ottaviano, a good Irish name. <laughs> At the apostrophe one day of the year. Yes. <laughs> she has photographs of a gentleman, of a major butler that I am going to talk about. And we have Major Butler's sword here as well. I thought perhaps the best way to tell the story would be to tell you about William Butler and allow you to hear some of his own words. These are the well, I'm no expert on what letters have been preserved, but letters from an Irishman from the Irish Brigade, this, you must hear his own words at some point, and I'm going to start right at the beginning. And then I'll talk a little about the Irish Brigade, and then I will talk about the Finian invasion of Canada and how Ulysses S. Grant dealt with all of that. Okay. To begin with, William Butler was born in 1831 in County Tipperary. And at age 13, he became an apprentice. And in, he was indentured. And amongst his Civil War letters were the papers he had to sign when he became an apprentice. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But here are all the things this 13-year-old boy had to agree not to do in order to become an apprentice. He shall not contract matrimony during said term. He shall not play at cards, dice, tables, or any other unlawful games whereby his master may have loss with his own or other goods during the said term. Without license of his said master, he shall not buy or sell. He shall not frequent taverns, alehouses, or playhouses, or absent himself from his master's service day or night. I don't know if William Butler ever finished this contract. I think I would have skipped town after the first couple of weeks. I do know that Mr. Butler was in America by 1856. The contract was signed in 1851. I'm sorry, 1844. Would have been completed in 1851. But William Butler is in New York in 1856. It appears that he followed his brother Ed to America. Ed, and I know this is a stereotype of the Irish, Ed apparently owned a liquor store or a pub, and many of William's letters from the war do talk about alcohol in its various forms. Now we know that William was in America in 1856 because in 1856 he enlisted in the 69th Regiment, 4th Brigade, 1st Division, 
New York State Militia. He was 25 years of age. 5 foot 11, fair complexion, blue eyes, and fair hair. And as I have said, most of the members of the 69th were Fenians. And I think William probably gravitated to kindred spirits. I'm reasonably sure the man was a Fenian himself. You may wonder where that name comes from. It's uh, based on characters from, I believe, Irish mythology. The Fianna, I think is the pronunciation. These were mythical warriors of the Irish past, great heroes. And the modern men who wanted to liberate Ireland saw them as role models. All right. I should say that throughout the Civil War, the Fenians were very clear about their plans for after the war. They held conventions. They were mentioned in all the newspapers. They said, we're going to invade Canada sooner or later. This was not a big mystery. When the war was declared, the 69th New York was one of the first regiments to reach Washington, D.C., one of the very first. The unit was activated for three months. Its enlistment would be up at the end of July. On July 21st, they participated in the Battle of First Bull Run. After the talk, if you want to take a closer look at our picture board over here, we have a photograph of members of the 69th New York taken in July 1861. They are at mass somewhere in Virginia. And by the look of it, I think this picture was taken before Bull Run. The men in this picture look entirely too unshell-shocked. Uh, the 69th uh, sustained about 100 casualties, 40 dead, 60 wounded. And their enlistment was up at the end of July. At which point, the federal government federalized the regiment and asked the militia members to re-enlist as federal soldiers, and the great majority of them did. At this point, William Butler was a first lieutenant. His colonel was Thomas Francis Meager, who would be a big wheel in the Fenian movement. And Meager, he was he was not shy about his long-term thinking. He said to his fellow soldiers, we fled Ireland because the British always were defeating us when we took the battlefield. They are professional soldiers, those redcoats. We're just men and boys from the farms. We knew nothing about meeting them on equal terms. Fighting for the Union is a good cause in its own right, but my boys, when this war is over, you will have become professional soldiers. You will be able to meet the Redcoats on their own terms. So going into this fight for the Union, we have multiple purposes. The 69th New York fought at Antietam, where it sustained 60% casualties. It was decimated at Fredericksburg, and it almost ceased to exist. By Chancellorsville in May of 1863, it was down to 300 men, only 300. So its ranks were replenished as the war went along. And in the end, the 69th would have lost the greatest number of killed and wounded in action of any New York State regiment. And it would be the sixth highest casualty rate in the entire Union Army. These guys learned what it would cost to become professional soldiers. Now, William was in a... Uh, when you speak of the Irish Brigade, you have to understand that several regiments made up the brigade. Uh, they came, a lot of them from New York, but not all of them. But they were mostly Irish. William was in a, uh, a segment of the brigade that was called Corcoran's Legion, because their general was a General Corcoran who, sadly enough, uh, died in a freak riding accident in December of uh, 1863. He was not killed in battle. All right. My original thought for the title of this presentation 
was Major Butler's sword, the Irish Brigade, Ulysses S. Grant and the Fenians. This is Major Butler's sword. This is the sword that Joya showed me in Schenectady. It was presented to him by members of the regiment. There is an inscription here. If you want to take a close look after the talk. Shall we let him okay. take a close look? Yes, you can take a close look. I've so. got it written out too. So that oh, I have it written out as well. <laughs> here, hang on to that. The story on the presentation of the sword was apparently it was presented to Major Butler sometime late in 1863. We have one of his letters, a letter home to his brother Ed in New York. And it says, the letter is from Fairfax County Courthouse in Virginia, November 3rd. Part, the letter partly reads, Mr. Conti arrived safe this evening and brought the sword with him in good order. From the hurry I was in the night it was presented, I did not examine it closely. I have done so now, and so have the officers of the regiment. They have remarked that it is beautiful, and so I think. Say to Dennis and all the gentlemen who was kind enough to present me with this token of their esteem that I shall ever be grateful to them for this act of kindness on their part. William would hang on to the sword for a few months, then he would return it for safekeeping to Ed in New York. An officer from his regiment, a Captain Haggart, would take the sword home on leave. Captain Haggart would be wounded a few months later at Cold Harbor. We have another, this is a sketch by an, one of those Civil War artists. It is of the Irish Brigade celebra celebrating St. Patrick's Day in 1863, horse races and so on. William was a part of that. He referred to attending that celebration in one of his letters. But he talked to Ed in his letters about many things, and I'm going to read a few excerpts so you get a, a hint of what an Irishman in the 69th might have been like. I hesitate to admit this because it does conform to the stereotype, but um, William really did like alcohol. His letters always mentioned it. And apparently Ed sent him all kinds of booze under all kinds of disguises. <laughs> See if it get past the, uh, the uh, not censors, but they didn't want all their soldiers getting drunk, obviously, so some of the big packages were in inspected. William writes home to Ed, I have just received the box containing the small keg. The paper and sawdust is quite damp, and yet I don't think much if any of it leaked. Captain Welfy, Welfsey says, you was determined that if they opened it, they would have some trouble. He says you ought to apply for a patent for packing boxes. <laughs> Made him feel quite warm before he got it open. Now, William didn't talk much about what it was to be Irish, but occasionally he had what I think are some kind of wistful references to being Irish. And here are just a couple of them. I am very glad to hear that Michael and family arrived safe and good health, and in good health. I am also very glad to hear of them neighbors of mine from County Tipperary, I think, who will come to this country and leave that island of poverty and starvation. I went to a wedding, and such an Irish wedding I did not see in many a year. It was not a very fine affair, but the old style made up for it. One old woman sang Irish songs, and I stayed there until four in the morning and went away well pleased. And apparently, uh, William was writing letters about the war back home to Ireland, and they were published in the Tipperary Free Press. And someday when I go back to Ireland myself, I think I'll do a field trip and see if I can find those letters. Now here is a letter 
He's asking at a favor. And this is so convoluted. If you can't follow it, it's okay. But the Irish names and the lilt of it is almost like poetry to me. Now there is a man here in the same regiment as Mr. Donahue named Peter Riley, a horseshoer. He worked a long time with Costigan, who lived upstairs. He came to me and he asked me to send his wife $15 to send it to you, and he would ask his wife to bring Costigan with her so that you would know it's all right by me, her keeping that. <laughs> to me, it sounded like poetry. What can I say? <laughs> this one is not quite so poetic, but... There's a Captain Joseph Mur Murphy coming home on leave uh, for seven days. He's from our regiment. He's a crony of the colonel's. If he calls, treat him civil and be on the lookout that he don't get any money from you. <laughs> and be sure no one hears anything about what I say of him. He is not much liked. Also to Dolan, tell him I would not be unsettled if he sent me some bottled ale. <laughs> and this one, I'm really puzzled about this one. I have asked leave for 15 days to go to Washington. I had to say I had made an arrangement with a young lady for certain purposes. It would have been useless for me to say I wanted to go home to see friends or to go home on business. <laughs> The draft was enacted, as you may know. Uh, well, the Irish were as divided as any ethnic group on many political issues. And when the draft uh, was uh, enacted, there were draft riots in New York City and in Troy, New York. I don't know about Troy, but in New York, it was mostly the Irish who led the draft riots. William does make one reference to the draft, to his brother Ed. There will be a draft now, in earnest. What does the boys say now? I hope you won't have to go. There are notes in his letters about contributing to the St. Bridget Society and having money in, and I thought this was um, like a nickname, money in the shoe and leather bank, and also an account in the Immigrant Industrial Savings Bank. In fact, Thank goodness for Google, I can look it up. These were real banks. Those were the real names. The Shoe and Leather Bank. These were founded by Irish immigrants in New York. All right. Finally, Ulysses S. Grant comes east. And in May of 64, the Great Offensive in Virginia begins. In June, there is the Battle at Cold Harbor. The 69th is in that battle. William writes home after the battle. In the front line of rifle pits at Cold Harbor Swamp, 10 miles from Richmond. A flag of truce was recognized from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. last night for the purpose of burying the dead and bringing in the wounded. The body of Captain Nugent was buried at the tree where he was killed and some others of our regiment. The body of Colonel McMahon of the 164th Regiment was brought in last night. His body was riddled and could not be recognized. We only recognized him by his clothes. I believe I told you about Captain E.K. Butler having died of his wounds. We lost on the third in the assault, two officers killed, five or seven men killed, 56 wounded and 26 missing. Some, I suppose, were taken prisoner and others perhaps killed as we had to charge through woods and swamp. My mind is so full of everything that I, I don't know today what I might have told you the last time I wrote. Well, the fighting continued. Uh, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac basically were locked in combat for weeks, day and night. The fighting shifted south to Petersburg. There were several Union assaults on Petersburg. In the end, they all failed, and siege warfare began. We picked June as an appropriate time to tell this story, because the attack on Petersburg began on June 14th, 
basically ran through June 16th and then the siege warfare began. Something happened to William Butler at Petersburg. This is a letter to Ed Butler back in New York. I am sorry to have to inform you that your brother the Major was severely wounded on the 16th near the town of Petersburg. He was sent north last night. I was with him until 10 o'clock and assisted to put him on board at City Point. He was put on the, the steamer Connecticut bound for Annapolis, Maryland. It is a splendid steamer and the wounded will receive every necessary attention from the nurses on board. His wound is very severe and will doubtless take some time to be perfectly healed. John Fahey, Captain. That letter was sent on June 20th. Today is June 20th. The next day, from the hospital bed in Annapolis, William writes a letter. He doesn't physically take up a pen and pencil. He can't do it. Someone sits at his bedside and writes down what he has to say. These are just excerpts. He tries to explain to Ed what has happened to him. The order to charge being given, the line advanced over the hill along the slope across the open field in the face of heavy in infantry fire. Now the text becomes unclear here and then it picks up. Driving the enemy from two streams sheltered by bushes, pursued them into the woods at the edge of which we, we received terrible fire where I fell. Feeling that my leg was broke, I desired to be carried to the hospital, which was done after great, a great deal of trouble and loss of blood. My wound is about four inches too high to attempt to take off my leg. So the only course to pursue is to try to knit the bones together, which will take a long time. The letter stops. It is taken up the next day. Wednesday, June 22nd. The writing of this letter was interrupted yesterday by the doctor coming to extract the ball. Chloroform was administered. It was successfully done. And the doctor has every hopes of my strength. And I think my strong constitution will get me over it. From what I learn, it will be at least three months before I can sit up. God give me the strength to hold on till that time. Give my love to my sister and cousins. Your affectionate brother William. July 15th, one, one month later. You will be pleased to learn that I am going on very favorably, though helpless as ever, and feeling very fatigued from having to lay still all the time. This last week I, I have not suffered so much pain. My, my wound is running quite freely. The swelling in my leg is getting reduced a little. The young man who is writing my letter, his wound pains him and he must close for the present. Oh, P.S. Tell Mr. Self I, uh, I feel very grateful for his kind present of wine and bitters and I will make good use of them. <laughs> August 11th. Uh, another month has gone by. The letter is hard to read at first. He refers to a lump on his thigh, uh, the bones still needing to knit. His, he's still unable to sit up. I don't lose courage on this account. As our surgeon said, he thought I would have to lay three months. But dear Ed, I am not recovering very fast and losing strength, of course. It is surprising how much matter comes out of my leg and yet there is a pretty large swelling yet. There's only two here that lost their legs and me left of those who came here together. All the others got well enough to go home on leave. Some nights I sleep very well, at other times I can't sleep at all. I don't suffer much from my leg wound. It only hurts when I am lifted and they lay me out straight in bed. My, my hand is nervous writing this, hoping to hear from you soon. Your affectionate brother, William. September 12th, one month later. Mr. E. Butler, respected sir, I take my pen to acknowledge the receipt of your kind letter, enclosing the photographs of that noble brother of yours. How shall I express my thanks to you? To say that I shall prize them will not express what I feel, 
for your brother was one that I loved to converse with. I saw and became acquainted with him on his first admission to the hospital, and his uncomplaining suffering gained my warmest admiration. Often when I have gone into his room those hot days and asked him, how are you, Major? His reply would be, very comfortable, thank you. I always took his fan and fanned him and kept away the flies for a while. With a smile, he would thank me and say, you don't know how much good that does me. But I did know. And I came and I sat by him as often as I could. I'm not a nurse, I'm a volunteer. My friend, you have reason to be proud of such a noble brother who went forth in the strength of his manhood to sustain the honor of the flag that protected him and you and me. I think of him as not lost, but just gone a little while before us to the land of rest and peace. Yours respectfully, your friend, A. Ambler. So William Butler died. He died of his wounds, suffered at Petersburg. His commander in Corcoran's legion had died, but Mrs. Corcoran, Mrs. General Corcoran, was still involved with the regiment. She checked to see how much money William had in his bank accounts and managed to send them, send his money to Ed. And there was a receipt in amongst uh, William's letters. Received from the Immigrant Savings Bank $779, the balance of the account of the late Major William Butler, signed Mrs. General William Corcoran. All right. So William never participated in the Fenian adventures that followed the war. But I do think he probably was typical of the young Irishman who concocted that incredible plan to seize Canada and free Ireland. As I say, throughout the Civil War, the Fenians and the Irish Brotherhood had conventions that were covered by the press. The British consul in New York could follow their plans. He subscribed to Irish American newspapers and read about what they were doing in the papers. He subscribed to a newspaper called the Fenian Spirit, which was published in Albany, New York. The Canadians knew what was coming. They set up a special unit to infiltrate Irish organizations. Where the Irish stood politically in regard to American politics was hard to tell. They did riot uh, when the draft came in. On the other hand, they served in the Union armies and some in the Confederate armies. In 1864, when Lincoln was running for re-election, the Republican platform included a resolution condemning monarchy on America's borders. This mainly pertained to Mexico because the French had moved in while we were busy fighting our civil war. The French had installed a puppet emperor in Mexico, but the Irish thought, well, they're talking about monarchies on America's borders. They must mean Canada because that is still part of Great Britain. So many Irish voted for the Lincoln administration because they believed Lincoln and his team were as hostile to England as they were. Actually, they weren't far wrong. Uh, I will mention this because this will come up in rela relation to the Fenians in a minute. The Canadians were not only watching the Fenians, they were watching some Confederate operatives in Canada. In Montreal, there were several Confederates sent up there by the Richmond government, and their task was to come up with ways to harass the North from the North. Among other things, they put together a uh, terrorist attack on New York City, which failed. Uh, Greek fire was kind of like Molotov cocktails. Their henchmen attacked several hotels in New York simultaneously. The idea was to burn the city as Atlanta had been burned. The mixture failed to work. The fires were only very small. But in any case, there was this organization in Montreal tasked with bringing the war to the north. And those operatives in Canada, the Confederates, actually staged a successful raid from Quebec 
into Vermont. In October, Confederate soldiers dressed as civilians appeared in St. Albans, Vermont, and on signal rounded up the townspeople, put them under guard in the town square, and robbed all the banks, and then got back to Quebec. The Lincoln administration was not too thrilled with this, neither were the Canadians, but remember the name, St. Albans. All right. The war ends in 1865. The Finians are now beginning to really plan to invade Canada. But they want to know in advance what the American government will do if, in fact, they cross the border. So, leaders of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, late in 1865, they meet with President Andrew Johnson. Johnson will not say, I bless your invasion. But neither will he say, I will stop it. What he does say is, I cannot argue with facts on the ground. Meaning, he would turn a blind eye as the invasion took place. And if it succeeded, he would recognize this Irish force in southern Ontario as the Irish government in exile. But first they had to seize the ground and hold it. The Irish Republican uh, leaders thanked him, reminded him one of his ancestors came from County Antrim, and went off to organize the invasion. Now one of my favorite figures from the Fenian invasion, there's so many I could name, was a fellow named Thomas Sweeney, and let me explain why I was interested in him. I had an ancestor that fought at Shiloh in the 52nd Illinois. And his commander was Colonel Sweeney. Colonel Sweeney would actually command a brigade at Shiloh. But this guy, Sweeney, was one of the toughest Irishmen you will ever meet. Born in County Cork, came to America, wound up at West Point, fought in the Mexican War, lost an arm. He had an arm amputated. This would have ended the career of any ordinary military man, but not Sweeney. He stayed in the army. And by the time of the Civil War, he was really moving up through the ranks as an aggressive fighting man. Here's how aggressive he was. Now, during one of the battles, a fellow Union officer began ordering his troops around, and Sweeney, with one arm, started a fist fight with his brother officer and beat him. That's how tough a guy Sweeney was. This is a picture of Thomas Sweeney. This is a newspaper from 1862, The Heroes of Shiloh. You will see a picture of Ulysses S. Grant and on his immediate right, Sweeney. So I got really interested in this guy. Sweeney was uh, at the end of the war still in the regular army, but he resigned to become, and I want to make sure I get this title right, he was going to become the Irish Provisional Government's Secretary of War. Grant knew what he was doing, didn't make an issue of it. Sweeney would take up residence in Albany. He would start buying up war surplus weapons. The American government would sell all kinds of rifles and pistols to the Irish wouldn't give them artillery, wouldn't give them war horses, but they gave them all kinds of rifles and small arms. And Sweeney actually virtually cleaned out uh, the, the arsenal in uh, Philadelphia, uh, the Bridesburg arsenal. He really equipped this invading army very well under the circumstances. Again, the American government doesn't utter a sound. Neither does Grant. And why is this? They really do hate England, the Americans, because, as you know, during the Civil War, England almost recognized the Confederacy as an independent government. It, it, it accorded the Confederacy belligerent status, which was bad enough. According to the English, it was legal for them to send arms to the South. And the real thorn in the side of the North was that 
commerce raiders were built in English shipyards. These were fast-moving ships that ultimately would prey on Union mer merchant vessels. The fastest of these uh, quasi-pirate vessels was the Alabama. And after the war, the American government said to Britain, the Alabama and other vessels did millions of dollars to our economy. We want you, England, to pay us reparations. And England said, you're crazy, no. The Alabama claims became a very big thorn in the side of international politics between America and England. This is why, in part, the American government and Ulysses S. Grant were turning a blind eye to what the Irish revolutionaries were doing. They wanted England to get poked in the eye. All right. By the spring of 1866, the rebels are ready to go. In April, along the border between Maine and New Brunswick, suddenly 700 Irishmen are turning up in the little fishing villages. They are under the command of a John O'Mahony. Their object is across this little body of water on the Canadian side of the border. They are aiming to capture Campobello Island. It may ring a bell from FDR's history. Yeah. Yep. Now, what happened? I've read three accounts of what happened next. The British account, the American account, and the Irish account. I'll give you the bare bones and then I'll try to interpret this. The Irishmen are waiting for a ship loaded with arms that Sweeney had purchased, waiting for an arms ship to come in to Eastport, Maine. What comes in instead is an American gunboat. And on board is George Gordon Meade, the hero of Gettysburg, a really high-ranking officer in the American Army. America has been divided into regions uh, for military purposes. Meade has say over the Northeast and New England. Suddenly here he is on a ship with several big guns. He gets in and he waits. And a day later the arms ship that the Irish have hired arrives and he seizes it. He takes the arms ship back south to New York City. Okay. Without arms, the Fenians cannot invade New Brunswick. So this fizzles out. But what really happened? The British say Campobello Island is in the middle of Passamaquoddy Bay. And English warships were in Passamaquoddy Bay and they intimidated the Finians into giving up the invasion. The American government, for public purposes, said we didn't want an international incident, so we did not let the Irish get the arms. The Fenians said, years later, well it is true that the Yankees took our weapons and they took our ship back to New York, but do you know what? They turned the arms over to the Irish Brotherhood. They gave the arms back to us. What the Yankee government was doing on the border was saving our butts because had we gone over to Campobello Island, the English would have blown us away. The Americans were in collusion with us. They saved us. They did get the arms back, so maybe there was something to it. That's April 1866. Now I just will say, stop and think about that. George Gordon Meade, who's right up there in the highest tier of the American military, was there in person. You know the American government knew everything about the invasion. But again, was he there specifically to save the Irishmen? I don't know. Maybe. June 1st, 1866. And again, this 
porch chat. We wanted it to be in June for the second date. Suddenly, Buffalo, New York finds itself, there's thousands of Irishmen in the streets. Six or seven thousand have materialized out of nowhere. On June 1st, between a thousand and thirteen hundred of them get on barges that are towed across the Niagara River and they are invading southern Ontario. Sweeney is their Secretary of War. He posts an announcement to the Irishmen living in Canada and it reads in part, We are here neither as murderers nor robbers for plunder or spoilation. We are here as the Irish Army of Liberation, the friends of liberty against despotism, of democracy against aristocracy, of the people against the oppressor. In a word, our war is with the armed power of England, not with the people, not with the people of these provinces. We are against England upon land and sea until Ireland is free. The Fenians, I said many of them were veterans of the Union Army and the Irish Brigade. They were also veterans of the Confederate Army. There were many Irish units in the Southern Army. And in Buffalo, they all came together. You had men in their own old blue Federal uniforms standing together with men in their old gray Confederate uniforms with maybe a green armband to show that they were now part of the Irish Army. Some of the units that invaded Canada, the 7th Buffalo, the 18th and 19th Ohio, now these are Irish units, the 13th Tennessee, the 17th Kentucky, independent companies from Indiana and New Orleans, and the Finian Louisiana Tigers. The Louisiana Tigers were a real unit during the war, and they'd actually fought the Irish Brigade at some point. But anyway, they all turned up on the same side this time. They are going to invade Canada, and they do it. They get across the Niagara River because, although there was an American gunboat in the river, permanently stationed there on the international border, Finians have infiltrated the crew. And just before the invasion, they disabled it. They disabled, uh, the name of the ship was the, the, the Michigan. It would take 14 hours for the damage to be repaired. And in those 14 hours, the invaders ran wild. And I've read, and I don't, I don't know if I can quite believe this. Apparently the Finians also were going out recruiting Mohawk Indians and blacks. According to something I found, 500 Mohawks were ready to cross the border into Canada, and 100 black men who had been in the Union Army were also waiting. They never got across, as it turned out, but I found that intriguing. All right. The Irish Army crosses the border. They're in southern Ontario, marching west. They will come to a little railroad junction called Ridgeway. It's important that they grab this town. The Canadian militia has uh, mobilized. Redcoats are coming, but they're not there yet. The Finians are luring the, the militia into an ambush. But as the militia approaches, somebody on the Canadian side sees some riders, some men on horseback on a ridge. These are not Fenians. They don't have a cavalry. Who the heck they were, nobody knows. Maybe local farmers. But the militia thinks, my God, the Fenians have cavalry. So they stop their advance. They don't walk into the trap, but they form a hollow square, which is the way to defend against cavalry. The Fenians see this. A moment before, there's been a solid line of militia advancing. And now it's a square, meaning only one quarter of the rifles are now pointed at the Irishman. This is the time to attack, and they do. At the Battle of Ridgeway, the Fenians are victorious. The number of dead and wounded on each side is debated, but the numbers I have heard are 31 Canadians killed in action, 
94, uh, 94 wounded, 39 Finians killed, 19 wounded. All right. The war for Ireland's freedom has begun. Here is a print of the Battle of Ridgeway. On the right, you have the Canadian militia in red coats. On the left, you have the heroic Fenians in lovely green matching uniforms, which they never had. <laughs> but that's what the painter wanted to portray, fighting under the, the green flag. Okay, the invasion has begun. The British ambassador in Washington immediately demands an audience with President Johnson. He said, you know what's happening on the northern border? You, you've got to stop this. And Johnson says, well, our border with Canada is over a thousand miles long. Uh, we can't patrol every mile of it. Uh, how do we know where anything's going to happen? And the British Council, uh, ambassador gets livid. He said, we know where they are. They're at Buffalo. And Johnson said, well, maybe, but the border's so long, we're going to have to search here and there, and we'll do our best. Frustrating the British ambassador, no end. Where's Ulysses S. Grant? By chance, on June 1st, Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia, are at West Point. They are attending a funeral. One of the grand old men of the American army, the hero of the War of 1812, General Winfield Scott, has just died, and his funeral is being held at the point. Theoretically, Grant is uh, preoccupied with this, but I, I am sure he was getting on the horn by telegraph with George Gordon Meade. Because Meade is suddenly in Buffalo. Meade has Grant's orders to go there and assess the situation. But Meade gets there and he is not sure what to do. So he sends a telegram to President Johnson, who does not reply. He's buying time for the Irish to become facts on the ground. Well, the border is still porous. More Fenians are tr trickling across the river on barges. The most that Meade can think to do without orders from Washington is to bring American troops at least close to the city. So he does that. Now rumors are coming in. There's other Fenian units further north in Malone, New York, and St. Albans, Vermont. This is turning into maybe a war on several fronts. Maybe. All right. Grant leaves the funeral. He and Julia hop on a train and they go straight to Buffalo. In the meantime, the British ambassador is back with President Johnson pleading with him, saying, what is it going to take for you to stop this? And Johnson says, I'm just preoccupied. You know, I'm a little distracted. I've been thinking about the Alabama claims. Do you think there's any chance England will reconsider about paying us reparations? You think there's any chance, Mr. Ambassador? The ambassador throws up his hands. I'm not sure. I did. But in the end, the British ambassador says, all right, in the name of my government, I will authorize that negotiations begin about paying reparations based on the Alabama piracy. Suddenly, President Johnson wakes up and he said, oh, there's, there's Irishmen up on the border, armed, really? I should, I should impose the Neutrality uh, Act, shouldn't I? And he does. Once he has declared that, five days have gone by. Grant is with Meade in Buffalo. When the order finally is issued, uh, Grant and Meade send telegrams all across the Northeast saying, there may be armed shipments heading north for these Irish fighters. 
uh, they, they send these telegrams to counties, to towns, to state governments to stop the arms from reaching them. And it's incredibly successful. Virtually overnight, trains carrying arms are stopped, which tells me that the federal authorities had this secret army well under observation all along. Okay. The Fenians in Canada, suddenly the border is sealed shut. They can't get reinforcements. They can't get arms and ammunition over. And now the Redcoats, the professional fighters, are very close. The Fenians know that they better get out. So they go back to the border. They get to Fort Erie, Ontario. There's another Canadian unit there. They beat them. And then they find whatever boats they can. They start crossing the Niagara River back to New York, where they are apprehended by American authorities. The invasion is over. So here's the situation. You've got thousands of armed and unarmed Irishmen right there in Buffalo. And Ulysses S. Grant and American Army units. What Grant does is the old Appomattox ploy. He says to these armed Irish, well, I should say in advance, although there was very high tension, whenever Meade and Grant were seen on the streets, the Irish, who had just served under these men, snapped to attention and saluted them. So they still loved their old commanders. Anyway, Grant and Meade say, if you will lay down your arms, you may go home, you will not be prosecuted, and in fact, uh, the American government will give you train tickets for free. What do you think? And most of the Irishmen agree to do that, and they do go home. Our old, uh, my old hero, Sweeney, when he saw the invasion failing and left Ontario, made it back to Albany, where he was apprehended by the authorities. Now all of this really wraps up on June 6th, but on June 7th, the Fenians who have been gathering at Malone, New York, and St. Albans, Vermont, they invade Canada anyway. <laughs> they go in. There's at least a thousand of them, maybe two thousand. They will seize Canadian towns. Pigeon Hill, Felixburg, St. Armand, and Stanbridge. But because Grant and Meade had stopped the armed shipments coming up to the border, they can't get reinforced either. They're left hanging. So although they've invaded and seized territory, this unit pulls back to New York territory as well. About Sweeney, and this I think tells you where Ulysses S. Grant's heart was. Sweeney had resigned the American army to join the Irish Liberation Army. He is apprehended in Albany, New York, but he is not prosecuted. And then he will go to Grant and say, I would like to rejoin the American army, not my old rank. And Grant says, welcome back. <laughs> so the Fenian invasion failed, but the Fenians did not give up. This is 1866. 1867, many of these men will go back to Ireland and stage a rising there against the English and be defeated and be imprisoned. Around 1878, Ulysses S. Grant and his wife just left the presidency. They're on an around-the-world tour. They are in Ireland. And a man comes out of the crowd, Grant, takes Grant's hand, starts shaking it, and says, You and your boys captured me at Paducah, Kentucky. This was an Irishman who had fought for the South, had been captured by Grant's forces in Kentucky, had joined the Finians in 1866, gone to Ireland, been captured, just released from prison, and he's delighted to see Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> <laughs> but the Fenians in America are not through. 
Grant is now president. In May of 1870, there is yet another invasion. This one directly from Vermont into Ontario. There is a battle in Quebec at a place called Eccles Hill. Six or seven hundred Irishmen invade. They engage the Canadian militia. Again, casualties are hard to know. Uh, the, the Fenians actually had a cannon this time, but it was captured. They lost perhaps 25 altogether, the Fenians. Uh, the Canadian militia, I don't know. Uh, they were commanded by a John O'Neill. We know there was one civilian killed in this. Uh, the militia had moved into a little town, had occupied it, and at dusk, one of the residents of the town, an old lady who was deaf, came out in the dusk and she's walking down the street and a picket jumps out at her and says, who goes there? She's deaf, she doesn't hear him. And he shoots and she's killed. A, a Canadian civilian was killed by Canadian militia. Okay. So this invasion fails too. And this is during Grant's administration. The, uh, this force is commanded by John O'Neill and he ain't done yet. In 1871, the next year, John O'Neill is out in North Dakota leading a Fenian invasion of Manitoba. In fact, one of his colleagues sends a telegram to Grant, President Grant, saying this would be a terrific opportunity to annex Western Canada and make it part of the United States. Will you send American troops to assist us? Grant doesn't even answer the telegram. No way. This invasion, to say it has elements of farce, understates it. The Fenians seize a Canadian post office because this is government property. And there is a Hudson's Bay Company post which symbolizes the British economy. They seize that as well. What they don't know is that a year before the exact location of the boundary had been in dispute. It had been resurveyed and pushed two miles north. They were still in American territory. <laughs> oh. The post office was abandoned. The Hudson's Bay Company post was abandoned. They had seized what was now American property. <laughs> and you can guess what the American military did. They grabbed the Fenians, and that was the last of the Fenian invasions. Now we're talking 1871. We have President Grant. What is he thinking about Ireland and Irish revolutionaries? Here's what he's thinking. Fourteen Irish revolutionaries captured in Ireland and imprisoned in England have been told by the British, we will free you if you, one, don't return to Ireland and two, you get out of the United Kingdom entirely. So these 14 revolutionaries sail to America. They are greeted in New York Harbor by a federal vessel bringing a letter from Ulysses S. Grant welcoming them to America and inviting them to come to the White House. <laughs> which they will. Ulysses S. Grant will actually entertain Irish revolutionaries in the White House. I think he really did support Irish independence. He really did hate monarchies. Uh, he said that on more than one occasion. And I think this was a chess game still with England about the Alabama claims. England and America had not come to terms. Finally, uh, many Americans wanted to go to war with England over this. And Grant had done something unprecedented. He said, no, we're not going to go to war. But there's this new thing that has started, an international tribunal that supposedly settles cases like this. America will submit to binding arbitration on the issue with England if England will agree. And England did. And one year later, 1872, the claims were settled in America's favor. We made out very well, and England actually paid up. So I think in welcoming these Irish revolutionaries, Grant was saying much about what he felt for Irish desires for independence, but also what he thought of England, which was not high on his 
he was not sending a lot of Christmas cards to the Queen. And he was also aware of changes in America. In his year, early years, Grant had been very suspicious of immigrants. He says so in his memoirs. I'll give you some statistics that I know he must have known. In 1840, New York City's population was 64% native-born and mostly Protestant. But by 1870, when Grant was president, 47% of New York's residents were foreign-born and 20% were Irish. So Grant was growing in his awareness of the multicultural tapestry that is America. He's, by the time he was president, he really had become much more open uh, to people of all races and religions. But I want to end on a note that just tickles me to death, and I hope you enjoy it too. The Irish still didn't give up. <laughs> the Finians had what they called the skirmishing fund. That is how they bought all those arms. In 1881, the Fenians skirmishing fund funded the construction of a submarine to prey on British shipping. It was built by the Delamater Ironworks in New York. The sub was 31 feet long, 6 feet wide. It could dive to 60 feet, displaced 19 tons. Its designer was an Irishman. His last name was Holland, but he had been born in County Clare. He was Irish. It had a pneumatic gun, 11 feet long, three-man crew. Mr. Holland would go on in later years to become the father of the American submarine fleet. He knew what he was doing. The sub was tested in some rivers in New Jersey and it worked. The name of the vessel was the Fenian Ram. <laughs> There was some trouble with funding. The Irish organization thought it had paid Mr. Holland in full. He said, you haven't, and until you have, you may not have your submarine. So the Irish Brotherhood stole it <laughs> and towed it to Long Island Sound. And then put sailors on board, and then they realized my God, this is not like a regular sailing ship. We don't know how to operate this thing. <laughs> and Holland wouldn't tell them. The Fenian Ram never preyed on British shipping, even though it could have. It was owned, it was put in warehouses for years. In 1916, it was exhibited in Madison Square Garden to raise money for the 1960 Easter Rising in Ireland. The Fenian Ram still exists. It is in the Patterson, New Jersey Museum. The Irish were incredibly creative, I have to say. Uh, but their invasions of Canada had an unintended consequence. It convinced the Canadians that they had to become an independent country. They couldn't rely on England for self-defense. So the invasions began in 1866. By 1867, the Canadian provinces had all come together. The Fathers of Confederation had worked out their own constitution. The Fenian raids helped Canada as a nation become an independent country. How ironic. And the raids are remembered as vital to Canadian history. And here is a medal. The Fenian Raid of 1866. This medal has Queen Victoria on one side. You can pass that around. It turned out that although the raids did not free Ireland, they helped Canada gain its independence. Ironic. So, I guess that's really what I have to say about the Irish Brigade, Grant, and the Fenians, but I want to tell you the next porch chat next week, 
I will be doing a historical portrayal. I'll be portraying Thomas Pendle, who in 1864 was a detective on the Washington, D.C. police force. And then he was assigned to guard President Lincoln. Pendle and three other detectives were assigned to the White House. Pendle would have the job at the White House for 36 years. When he joins us next week, he will be talking about what he saw in the Lincoln White House, the Johnson White House, and the Grant House, White House. And one more thing. I can't help, I know this is going to seem immodest, but I have a lot to be modest about. <laughs> we tell stories here about General Grant for the most part, but there are other stories connected with this place. We have just published a small book about some of these stories you, you hardly ever hear on the tours, but are just fascinating. I wrote this myself. It came on sale three, four days ago. We have copies down in the visitor center. Thumb through it. You might find it interesting. Thank you.